And the observation of Hannah already is a, it's another short one. So we will look at Jude, and we're just going to kind of, we're not going to spend a whole lot, we're just going to spend today and whatever we get through today with Jude, I'm sure that we could probably break it down into a whole series of things, but I'm not going to torture us like that. Um, so if somebody will start reading, that'll, that'll work, we'll, we'll, uh, we'll read Jude and then we'll talk. Anybody want to? Anybody Jude, has a servant of Jesus Christ and a brother of James, to those who have been called, who are loved in God the Father and kept for Jesus Christ, mercy, peace, and love for yours in abundance. Dear friends, although I was very eager to write to you about the salvation we share, I felt compelled to write and urge you to contend for the faith that was once for all entrusted to God's holy people. God's holy people. Who uh, who pervert the grace of our God into a license for immorality and deny Jesus Christ for our only sovereign and Lord. Back up a minute, verse 4, what did you say <laughs> again? Uh, for certain oh, people... for certain individuals whose condemnation was written about long ago, who, secret, who have secretly slipped in among you, they are ungodly people who convert the grace of God. Okay, because I thought you were saying something no, like God's holy it people. Like, it's a like continued chapter, and then it just picks up whatever the ungodly people I got was. you. Okay. Go ahead. Though you already know all of this, I want to remind you that the Lord at one time delivered his people out of Egypt, but later later destroyed those who did not believe. And the angels who did not uh, keep their, pos their positions of authority, but abandoned their proper dwelling. These he has kept in darkness, bound with everlasting chains for judgment on the great day. In a similar way, Sodom and Gomorrah and the surrounding times gave themselves up to sexual immorality and perversion. They serve as an example of those who suffer the punishment of eternal of eternal fire. In the very same way, on the strength strength of their dreams, this and all the people pollute their own bodies, reject authority, and keep abuse of celestial beings. But even their archangel mm -hmm. Michael, when he was Disputing with the devil about the body of Moses, did not himself dare to condemn him for slander, but said, The Lord rebuke you. Yet this people slander whatever they do, they don't understand. And the very thing they do understand by instinct, as irrational animals, animals do, they destroy them. Oh, I think that. Woe to them, they have taken the way of Cain. They have rushed for profit into failing error. They have been destroyed in court rebellion. These people are blemished, are blemishes at your law feast, eating with you without the slightest form. Shepherds who feed only themselves, they are clouds without rain, blown among by the wind, autumn trees without fruit and unbeaded, twice dead. They are wild waves of the sea, foaming up their shame, wandering stars, for whom blackest darkness hath been reserved forever. Enoch, the seventh from Adam, prophesied about them. See, the Lord is coming with thousands upon thousands of his holy ones to judge everyone and to convict all of them of all the ungodly acts they have committed in their ungodliness and of all the defiant words ungodly sinners have spoken against him. These people are grumblers and fault finders. They follow their own evil desires. They boast about themselves and flatter others for their own advantage. But dear friends, remember what the apostle of our Lord Jesus Christ will tell. They said to you, in the last times there will be scoffers who will follow their own ungodly desires. These are the people who divide you, who follow mere nat natural instincts and do not have the spirit. But you, dear friends, by building yourself up 
in your most holy faith and train in the Holy Spirit. Keep yourself in God's love as you wait for the mercy of the Lord Jesus Christ to bring you to eternal life. Be merciful, be merciful to those who doubt. Save others by snatching them from the fire. To others show mercy, mixed with fear, hating even the clothing stained by corrupted flesh. To him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you before his glorious presence without fault and with great joy. To the only God our Savior, be glory, majesty, power, and authority through Jesus Christ our Lord before all ages, now and forevermore. One of the great doxologies of, of the New Testament is verses 24 and 25. Him who is able to keep us from stumbling, keep us from falling, right? Well, this is probably one of the more short, neglected books. I, yes. Yeah, I'm actually really excited. But I was reading like, the little commentary part of my side, and I really like this. And it said these verses kind of read like a song that grows into a shout of praise. Yeah. Um, so it kind of starts out, not, not a little boy, I guess, but then it just turns into, I just like it, it's like a climax. I yeah, like well, it. I mean, that's, that's in essence what a doxology is. It's a praise, it's a magnification, it's <laughs> yeah. a glorification of, of God, uh, kind of crescendoing up, right, yeah. uh, to, to this glory to God, yeah. Um, uh, Ephesians 3 has another one now unto him who's able to keep mm -hmm. uh, uh, can wherever to do all things in him. Um, that, that's another one that, that, that is a great, uh, great doxology as well. Um, so yeah, let's look at this now in Jude. Again, uh, we're dealing with false teachers. And basically Jude is providing practical advice. Uh, two things that he's providing here. First of all, He's providing practical advice for how we are to keep ourselves in the love of God, how we're to keep ourselves in God's love. And then secondly, how we are to avoid the errors of false teachers. How are we to keep ourselves in God's love? And then how we are to avoid the errors of false teachers. Jude identifies himself as the half-brother of James, which is the half-brother of Jesus. Or the brother of James, the half brother of Jesus. Jude is the brother of James. Yes. And of course, you guys know the issue there, right? Wait, what happened to Mary? Yeah, that 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 you know, Jesus doesn't have the same father as what Jude and James do. He's conceived of the Holy Spirit, right? And James, Jesus, right. Um, interestingly enough, none of the family members uh, believed Jesus when he was walking on the earth. They actually came to faith a little bit later on, uh, and then, of course, write these letters, Jude and, and of course, oh, James wow. as well. Yeah, remember this? In, we, we talked about this in the Gospel of John, right? Show yourself the Feast of Tabernacles, uh, and we'll believe you. And of course, Jesus said no, and they even. And that's, that's, what they, that's what John says. Even his own brothers did not believe him. Then, of course, they do come to faith, uh, obviously, after the death, burial, and resurrection of the Lord. So when we talk about Jude, we're going to just talk about, first of all, um, how Jude describes the believer in six ways. He describes salvation or the salvation of the believer in six ways. And I'll give them, and then we'll kind of talk and all that kind of stuff. Um, First of all, he notes that we are called. We are called. That we're called of God, if you want to put it that way. That uh, similar to election in that it points to God's work in us, 
before we sought God, we're called. In fact, uh, 1C describes how we're called. This is all under the first point. Uh, and that is that we God uh, gives an effectual calling. An effectual calling. And what an effectual calling is, is that basically when God calls us to salvation, He is successful. When God calls us to salvation, when he brings us to salvation, he is successful. That in a very general sense, everyone is called to faith and repentance. But the good news, of course, is that God is ultimately the one who enables our beliefs. He acts uh, in our lives and he is successful at it. He's effectual. It's designed to produce an effect. So the first description of the believer is that we're called of God. The second description of the believer is that we are beloved in God. Beloved in God. We have a love relationship with him because we can call him Father through, of course, Jesus Christ. Some of this we've talked about in John's letters, right? We we're born into his family. We become adopted into his family. All this has to do with being beloved in God. Yes, God is uh, powerful and above all, but he is also a tender, loving father to those who believe. Thirdly, uh, believers are described as those who are kept for Jesus Christ. We are kept for Jesus Christ. This uh, theme of keeping in 1C, this theme of keeping is the key theme, perhaps, in the book of Jude. It is one of the key themes, at least. This theme of keeping. And it has, and I'll repeat this in just a moment, it has eschatological, end times, uh, goals in view. All right? So it's, it's an important theme, and it has end time goals. In view, and I'm gonna give you some examples in just a moment. Sorry, did you say uh, the theme for Jude is keeping? Yes, one of the one of the major themes for Jude is keeping. Yes. So what do you say it has? Eschatological? It has end time eschatological future goals in view. In other words, he just doesn't keep you temporarily, right? He doesn't live. Uh, looking at verse 1, of course, as we just mentioned, we're kept for Jesus Christ. Uh, we as Christians, in verse 21, are called to keep ourselves in the love of God. Verse 21, we're called to keep ourselves in the love of God. On the other hand, there were angels who did not keep themselves. And we'll talk about this in just a moment, but just right this minute, get it in verse 6. Angels who did not keep themselves in their realm of authority, in their proper, they didn't stay in place, okay? They, now they are kept in eternal chains in the day of judgment. So we're talking about angels who did not keep themselves in the proper sphere of authority, and now they are kept in eternal chains in the day of judgment. And according to verse 13, this judgment is also um, being kept for false teachers. 
And everything is related to this idea of false teachers. He'll use a lot of examples. In fact, we'll talk about it in just a moment. A lot of examples from the Old Testament, but everything is pointing back to uh, these false teachers and how they are, um, how we should deal with them. In light of such dangers, it is vitally helpful to know that God is keeping us for Christ. That we do not ultimately keep ourselves. Yes, we are to, in essence, keep ourselves with the love of God, but it is ultimately God who is keeping us for Christ. He presents us as God presents his bride, uh, or the bride of Christ, to Christ. So that's the theme of keeping. All right, we're backing up now to 1B, and we are on number 4. As far as the way Jude describes the believers and salvation as having a common salvation. We talked about six ways. We haven't, we haven't talked about all those, so we're on number four. Common or common? Common, common, common. common. A similar. Common. Yes. Was salvation. <laughs> we all be saved. That's, that's what we're doing. Yeah. There are not varying ways of salvation for different people, nor anyone inherently worthy to enter into the kingdom of God. We all share the same salvation that is a gift of God for the sinners who are unable to save themselves. In fact, the brother of Jesus is in need of this same salvation just as you and I are. When you rededicate your life, what does that fully mean? Basically, that you're re repenting again. That you're just you're asking, you're saying sorry and repenting and turning from a mistake. I mean, that's that's basically what you're doing when you rededicate your life. I, I guess we talk about it after long periods of time. You know, somebody who was once in the church, once in Christ, and then they drift away, and now they rededicate their life to Christ. It, it just it's a it's a it's a renewal in essence, of their relationship to, to Jesus Christ. That's what they're talking about there. But really, you know, if you're a believer, if you're a true believer, have you really, you know, fallen out of grace with the Lord? Have you really just left Him? You're, you're making a, a, a commitment, a recommitment unto Christ. I don't know why, but it's just, I don't know. Yeah. Yeah, it is. I mean, you know, again, we talked about this, right? If, if God is so powerful and sovereign in his grace, does he lose his own children? Does he, is he able to lose his own children? And we talked about the fact from John that, that he doesn't lose his own children. In fact, Jude even says, now unto him who is able to keep you from falling, right? It's the sovereign grace of God that is able to keep you from falling. In our minds, we think of it as rededication, as a recommitment, that we have fallen away in, in our minds. And, 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 and yeah, maybe there are periods and moments where we slack off from God's grace, or not from God's grace, but we slack off from our Christian living. We slack off from, there, there are, put it this way, there are more bad day, days than there are good days, you know? Yeah. In practicing righteousness, we should always practice righteousness. But you, I mean, we we've lived long enough, right? That maybe there, hopefully, they're not days, but there, but there sometimes there are. Sometimes there are more bad days than good days. Or maybe you have a bad day, and you need to. You feel like there needs to be this recommitment, rededication, re. Okay, Lord, thank you for your grace. Thank you for keeping me. I'm going to recommit myself and read 40 chapters of the Old Testament. No, I mean, you know, but, but you know, how, whatever it is that you feel like you need to, to do, it's more on our part. It's not on God's part. It's, 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 uh, well, that's what, if you hear it from Pentecostal Wesleyan perspective, yeah, it's, it's like, well, they were, they were drifting away for a long time and now they have rededicated their life back to the Lord, you know, um, and in one sense, that's true from man's perspective, not so much from God's perspective. Because if you were his child, and if he's committed his grace to you, has he really lost you? Right. You know, train up a child in the way they should go, and when they depart, they will, you know, not, yeah. they will not wander, they will not depart, you know, that kind of thing. So it's, so it's more from our perspective, yeah. Yeah, I think what 
what that is is like some of us that are born in the Christian faith. Right. And we we'll grow up with the parents and at a but at a certain time when we're in our home, we kind of live the yeah. ways that the parents brought us up. Right. We just kind of rebel. Yeah. Be on our own. But at, at a point in time when we kind of realize that see we need to kind of get more committed to God. Right. That. Well, that's what some of us look at to rededicate ourselves right. back yeah. to God. Just to come back to Him. It's but not they grew God. up in it. Right, yeah, yeah. yeah. They yeah. Like grew up yeah. in it. But like, right. Like she said, it should just drift away. Yeah. Like, they didn't make that some, connection. Some of my brothers that have yeah. not been in church for years. Right. But we are all born and brought up in the Christian. So right. a day that is coming, which I believe, Right. That one of one of them, some have gone back, but one of them I'm still believing Amen. that right. one day he will go back to church because yeah. every every one of us are saying that there's a call of God in his life. Right. Because when we were right. growing up, he used to preach. Yeah. You know, and he's running from it, right? Yeah. Now he 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 can't like. Even if there is a special occasion, he can just dress up when he gets to the door, or something like that. Right. He'll go. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Is that bad? Yeah. But I know that one day, right. you know, right. one day he will come back, and that yes. will be like rededicating himself back. Yes, to yes. exactly, yes. exactly. So in that case, that's yeah. That's what I'm talking about. Yeah, okay. yeah, yeah. Someone yeah. that's grown up in it, but like, <coughs> right? They just never kind of walked away was, from it a little bit. Right? Or they did, at the age they were at, they never fully. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's a lot of bees in here. They're living in the things. Yeah. I told Dean, hey, you don't worry. Okay, you good? Yeah, Okay, I'm not worried about the lots of them there. I'm just worried about the one that was right there. Yeah, but they're coming out with <coughs> the lights. They're, you can see them walking around. Yeah, we got something going on up there, I think. But yeah, that, that's just... Like, yeah. It's like they never made that... They didn't know. Right. Saying it's just being young. Well, and, and that also, you know, growing up... I guess it would be a negative aspect of growing up in a Christian family. A negative aspect of growing up in the church is you grow up in the church with the mentality, that, well, I've just been saved all my life, kind of right, thing. You know, right. um, and, 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 and I hate to say it's a negative thing, but you know, if you're not taught, hey, even if, when you are growing up in the church, you need to personally have a relationship right. with Christ. If you're not taught that. Then you can have the mentality, hey, I've grown up in church all my life, I'm okay, you know, that kind of stuff. And, and then, of course, when you go astray and all that kind of stuff. But, but people need to be taught, the children need to be taught, you need to have, you're not saved because I'm saved. You need to have right. your own personal yeah. <coughs> relationship with Christ. So, yeah. Yeah. All right, number five, number five is that we are, believers are a new community of God's people. We're a new community. I love that one. That basically we share uh, the blessings of salvation, but we're also able to build one another up in faith. In other words, we should be able to encourage like we're doing now. We should be able to encourage one another, right? Uh, because we are a community of God's people. And then finally number six is that this faith for salvation was once for all delivered. This faith for salvation was once for all delivered. That salvation, and you guys know this, this should be second hand to you. It is not something that we work up by our own effort. It is a gift that is delivered to us. It is the gracious, gracious nature of the gospel that Jude is uh, talking from and writing from here. It says, once and for all, alluding to, of course, the once and for all sacrifice of Christ uh, for our sin. That Romans chapter 6, Hebrews chapter 9, 1 Peter chapter 3, um, going back to Hebrews chapter 10 as well. All of these things talk about the once and for all sacrifice. 
We didn't uh, earn our salvation. We didn't adjust the message. We simply trust in Christ. And the message of the gospel has been given to us. Jude says we must uh, paraklon, <coughs> paraklon a uh, uh, epigon nizomai. That's not English. Uh, no, it's not English. It's Greek. Paraklon is simply earnestly. Uh, epigon nizomai is to contend for. So the, is that one whole thing? The whole phrase is what Jude says to earnestly contend for. Um, Epigenism, oh, whatever it is, says, says to struggle with. To struggle with. To earnestly contend for. Uh, in fact, the, the initial idea of apago, the, 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 it's kind of like a, a compound word there. Uh, apago means to bring upon, to bring upon. So when you are earnestly struggling, contending for the faith, you are in essence bringing it upon yourself. You are taking it on, taking the fight upon yourself. And by the way, paraclon is a participle, present, active, continuous verb. <coughs> so therefore, this is not a one-time fight. It is a continual contending for the faith. It's not like we fought one match and then we've won the match and now it's over. It's kind of like taking up your cross. It's crucifying the flesh. It is a continual daily contending for the faith. Right? And that's what we're supposed to do is we're supposed to earnestly contend for the faith. And why must we earnestly contend for the faith? Well, verse 4 tells us. Verse 4 tells us that false teachers have come in and they have perverted the grace of God. into sensuality. Sensual. Uh, things that appeal to the senses. Sensual. Again, it all goes back to like the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life. And let me repeat it now. False, false teachers have come in and have perverted the grace of God into sensuality. In fact, Jude says, and this is from the New King James, certain men have crept in unnoticed. In other words, they have infiltrated the church. And again, heresy sneaks in and it works best. How? Yeah, when it's mixed in with the truth, right? Um, and usually it's homegrown. It's usually homegrown. Um, or if there's some kind of community knowledge. Again, there was a woman named Jezebel floating around in Revelation 3. Hey, let's invite her to speak at our church. No, right? <laughs> Ungodly leaders who have crept into the church were twisting the gospel of free grace into a license of living footloose and fancy free in regard to sin. In other words, they were twisting the gospel of free grace to say, hey, you can live any kind of way you want to. Same kind of plight that Paul deals with in Romans 5 and 6. And for Jew, this is not an option for the disciple and for any New Testament, uh, any, anybody you read in the New Testament, it is not an option for the disciple. You should not continue to practice in sin, right? Jude is saying the same thing. So.
So what I want to do now is give us, and notice how I have it broken down here, or Jude has it broken down actually. I want to give us seven warnings of destruction. Seven warnings, Jude gives these warnings of destruction of people who were doomed to be destroyed. And I have it broken down by, he gives three just simply just Old Testament wicked scenarios. And then he gives, and these same people are wicked as well, but three other examples of folks who not only did wickedness, but they led others astray. And then he talks about the one prophecy of Enoch. So seven warnings of destruction. And again, all of this is to talk about and relate to the false teacher who's doing the same thing. The false teacher is not only sinful in himself, the false teacher is also leading others astray. That's the point of what Jude is saying. So the first example is Israel out of Egypt. Israel out of Egypt. And basically this is the warning don't rebel after experience experiencing salvation. Don't rebel after experiencing salvation. This is in verse 5. Now I want to remind you, although you once fully knew it, that Jesus who saved a people out of the land of Egypt afterward destroyed those who did not believe. That's an interesting verse. There are a bunch of people that came out of Egypt, right? But he destroyed those that did not believe. In other words, we're talking about a pattern of rebellion after receiving this experience of deliverance from Egypt. The Old Testament precedence here is, of course, the Exodus generation. Because remember what happened to the Exodus generation. What happened to the generation that came out of Egypt? They died in the wilderness. Yeah, they died in the wilderness. Why did they die in the wilderness? Disobedience. Yeah, disobedience and unbelief. Okay. And yes, unbelief. They didn't, they got something. What were they supposed to do? What did God tell them to do? Where were they going? Yeah, they were going to the promised land. So they sent spies in. Right, yeah, they sent spies in. And 12 spies were sent in. And how many came back that were uh, gave, gave a bad report? How many came back with a good report? Two. Two came back with a good report. Joshua and Caleb, right? And yet, who do the people believe? Yeah, the other 10. So that generation of 20 years and older died in the wilderness. I'm sorry? Yeah, that's democracy. It should have been a theocracy. God, God said go and they should have went. I was about to say, like, since when people are right and choosing the correct thing. Oh, yeah. I mean, again, it shows human depravity. It shows that we really can't make a good decision on our own. Amen, right? Amen. I mean, we really can't. You give us the right way to do something and the dumb way to do something, and chances are we're going to choose the dumb way. You give us instructions on how to put together a bike, chances are if you're a man, you're going to put the instructions down and try to put the bike together yourself. Right? I don't, I don't need instructions on how to put a bookshelf together. I've put one up, you know. And then you end up putting it up where it's, you know, it doesn't hold any books at all, right? Okay. Number two, number two, the second warning is about angels, uh, wicked angels, the sin of angels. And the warning is, uh, know your place in God's kingdom. Now, we need to use caution here because we don't know exactly what's going on. We can kind of assume that he's talking about the angels that fell with Lucifer. We don't know exactly what's kind of going on here. We read in verse 6, they did not stay, the angels did not stay with their own position of authority. 
but left their proper dwelling. And again, we just assume that they left their proper dwelling when they followed after Lucifer and they rebelled against God. And again, the idea here is the, uh, along the theme of keeping is that they did not keep their proper place. And so therefore now they are kept for destruction. They're kept for judgment. And this relates to the false teacher, of course, obviously, just as the angels did not escape punishment, neither will the false teacher escape punishment. In other words, I can't do anything about those people that are in word of faith, health, wealth, and prosperity, but there's coming a day. Number three, and that goes for any false teacher, by the way. Uh, <laughs> Y'all know me, I have some sickness going on. <laughs> Number three is Sodom and Gomorrah. Sodom and Gomorrah. And the warning is, don't follow your own desires. Don't follow your own desires. G O M O R R A H. Oh, I got close. Gamora. Oh, you got close. Don't follow your own. But still, she missed the mark. <laughs> anyway, don't follow your own. Don't follow your own desires. And I think the thing that I just, because I need to move on quickly. The thing that I want to say here is simply just this. Never let, uh, never celebrate sin in the name of magnifying grace. God never celebrates sin. In other words, it's the same thing. We, we should not practice continuing sin just so that the grace of God may abound. Because you do, right? Never cel let us never celebrate sin in the name of magnifying grace. And listen, those people had so much grace poured out on them. You do realize that, don't you? The people of Sodom and Gomorrah had so much grace poured out on them that God is willing to halt his judgment on them so that Abraham could find, what, 50 and then 40 and then 30 and then not even 10 righteous people in the whole city. Yeah. Hey, I'm sorry, just the end of it. We uh, never celebrate sin yeah. in the name of magnifying grace. Fine. Number four is Cain. Cain. And the warning is don't walk in hatred. And this has to go with the, the people. Well, yeah, I'm just, just, I mean... I won't ask it, ask you to break this thing down, okay? But what I'm saying is, yeah, this is a part of the seven warnings, all right? Uh, this is for the people, and, and the reason why they're leading others astray is the phrase in Jude that says uh, that these false teachers have gone in the way of Cain. They have been led astray and are leading others astray in the way, in the way of Cain. And that is, of course... Uh, you know, it, it, it denotes the trajectory of a person's life. It, it tells the, the path that they're on. And the path is one that is characterized by rebellion and murder. That's what these people were doing. These false teachers were characterized by rebellion and murder. And if not physical murder, definitely a hatred of the heart. Number five is Balaam. We could spend a whole lot of time on Balaam, but we don't have time. Balaam. And that is, uh, the warning is don't be a prophet for hire. Don't be a prophet, as in one who speaks prophecies, a prophet for hire. Which was Balaam, right? By the way, that, that, the reference for Balaam is Numbers, oh, Numbers 24, Numbers 25. 
that kind of thing. Balaam was one who was hired to prophesy against God's people. However, every time he tried to prophesy against God's people, he ended up prophesying good for God's people. That would be interesting. How does it not tell you already, like, if you're getting paid to prophesy? Yeah, something, yeah, yeah, something's wrong there. But, you know, you can get healed if you'll send me your check of 1995, right? And I'll give you a word if you'll give me 2995, right? <laughs> It just my, Stacey Watford, if you want to make it sound fancy, ministries, <laughs> right? Yeah, exactly, exactly. Uh, again, false teachers. I mean, this is isn't this, is this not the epitome of false teachers of today? Is that they're false teachers for hire? Let's bring in Jezebel, and we'll pay her about two or three hundred dollars to lead everybody astray into sexual immorality, right? Number six, because I need to hurry up. Number six is Korah, Korah, K-O-R-A-H. And that is simply don't, the warning is don't rebel against God's authority. Which is what Korah and his family did. How many people died with them? 200? 250. God's authority, yes. They were beautifully swallowed up by the earth. You've got to love the Old Testament. I'm in the book of Judges today in my Old Testament survey class. I get to tell the Ehud and Eglon story today. So. Hey, you happy? I'm very happy. I'm very happy. I have <laughs> pictures. in the bathroom. I, I, have, yes, I have pictures and slideshows and all that kind of stuff. So, yeah, I do, I do. All right, uh, number seven. Number seven is, of course, the prophecy of Enoch. The only words, apparently, we have recorded from Enoch, you know, the guy who walked with God and was not, for God took him. We don't have much information in Genesis, but we have information from Jude. And the warning is, as we have been talking about, don't lead others astray. And his wording goes like this, Behold, the Lord comes with ten thousands of his holy ones to execute judgment on all and convict uh, all the ungodly of all their deeds of ungodliness that they have committed in such an ungodly way. Uh, and all of the harsh things that they've spoken, that ungodly sinners have spoken uh, against him. And again, uh, Enoch is talking about those who not only uh, he must have saw, or Jude is talking about those who Enoch saw during his day preceding the flood, who were ungodly false teachers who were leading others astray. Henceforth, we have the flood. All right, real quickly, real quickly, five exhortations of Jude, of Christian living. And I promise you, real quickly, I have no commentary on them. I'm just going to give them. Verse 20. Build yourselves up in faith. You can fill out the rest of it from verse 20. Verse 21. This is number two. Keep yourselves in God's love. Again in verse 21. Live in the light of Jesus' return. Verse 22, this is uh, number four. Have mercy on those who doubt. Again, remember you're supposed to be harsh to the false teacher, gentle to those who are entrapped by their false teachings. Which brings me to number five. Uh, this is found in verse 23. Save them by snatching them. From the fire. Save them, those who are entrapped by false teaching, by snatching them. And again, I love the violent language here of Jude. It's like compel them to come in. It's, it's, 
Yeah. I think we're too nice in the society. We're, we're just too nice. When we really just need to start yanking people from the, I mean, you know, really, seriously, just start so snatching people. If, well, I mean, yeah, but if you see a brother, more so what he's talking about here is, if you see a brother or sister in Christ who has been gone astray, been leading astray by a false teacher, you don't need to just, I mean, Talk not, I mean, you know, do what you can and do what you got to do, but ultimately go, hey, listen, do you realize that the guy you're listening to is an idiot? I mean, that, that kind of thing. Do you realize that he's a false teacher? Do you realize that he's not? I mean, you know, that's what we're supposed to do is by snatching them from the fire. It's plainly speak the truth to them, right? That's the thing. All right. Thank you, brother. God bless you. Good night. <laughs> Peace out, everybody. <laughs> I see you going there. <laughs>